Okay, let's see if it shows my presentation. Do you see the same thing that's up there? Yeah. Okay. Well. Actually, no, it's not. What this is what I'm seeing. Oh, you're seeing that one. So, um, I should be able to change this, right? It's just because you have this, or or you have some non-mirrored display. Well, I just mirrored that one, but. Like, should I do the whole screen or this one? Maybe. It's going to be weird, though, when I switch between screens, right? That's not what you want. You making faces? I don't know. It's my other screen. That's not what we want either. Oh. It's kind of tough to do. Maybe I, I don't know. Um, let's see. Check here. Yeah, well, um, we probably don't show this thing. Let's see. I love how consistent this I should is. probably put some of it. No, that's the other one. I thought <laughs> it was this one. Don't worry. Um, we'll just. Like, I could show the other one, right? We can click all the buttons. Sorry, we're trying to figure out. We're trying to do a live thing and see if it we're works. We're trying to record the talk by doing a live stream. Which at least just one person watching, which is me. So, um. yeah. Matt, you are my Thank you. All right. All right. So the technology part is. What do you think? I think. Uh, I have been thought about this, but I haven't thought, but I will keep this laptop alive because otherwise we will do all the things. You should be able to hear me when I'm talking on the live stream, too, right? Well, I don't have this. Yeah. Because if there's no audio, I mean, yeah. people are going to be like, nice presentation. <laughs> <laughs> How's everyone doing tonight? Anyone have to drive very far? No, no one came up from Denver or anything? Good. Because uh, that can be tough, especially this time of night. I do have some stickers up here. If anyone's interested at the end, like if you're so motivated by what you see, you're like, I need a sticker that says that. Then come on up and grab one. I got some cards too if you need to contact me. Okay? I want to keep it right. <laughs> Let me know if you need my power cord. Uh, hi, everyone. Sorry for the late start. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, Thursday night. Yeah? Okay, yeah. good. So not the one. Um, this is Gigi Duke Golder. Uh, just by a quick show of hands, uh, who's here for the first time? Okay, great. Lots of newcomers. Uh, welcome. GDG is all about bringing together um, uh, Google developers, both from inside Google and from out in the broader developer community, and, uh, showing them cool resources and um, kind of bringing together to talk about our experiences developing with Google products and share information. Uh, we're open to everyone. Everyone's welcome here. And uh, so we thank you for coming. Uh, before we get started, we'll do just kind of like a quick run through. Does anyone have any announcements they'd like to make? Okay. Anyone hiring? Firing? <laughs> Not that we know. Me making announcements. All right. <laughs> yeah. uh, for those of you who have been here already, we've gone through this before. Uh, my name is Kitty Chen. I run this meetup group with uh, Dave, our co host. But the two of us also run an Android conference called 360 Ansys. It's happening in July. And we are looking for sponsors well, and attendees as well. So we want your money, basically. Um, so if you go to 360ncf.com, you can find all the information. Uh, talks are going to be announced soon. 
And this is in July. It may change after July with that new announcement. Uh, but if you have any leads on sponsors, let me know. I can really help running the conference. Looking for people to speak is actually the easier part. Looking for money is the difficult. So if your company or other competitor you know will be interested in supporting a local conference, you can send us. Uh, you can talk to me or Kate. Thank you. Cool. Take it away. All right. So how many people have heard of OAuth? Okay, so we got we got everyone, right? Is there anyone that hasn't heard of it? All right. Um, how many people know exactly what it is? Okay. <laughs> so I'm glad no one raised their hand or it's like, why are you here? Just to pick on me? <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Matt Rabel. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity and no running water. I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day. Actually, it was only a mile and a half, but it did feel like it was uphill both ways. In the winter, though, we got to ski, cross-country skis, and that was pretty cool. So I probably have 10,000 hours in of cross-country skiing, you know, but only from ages like 5 to 15 when we moved away. So um, I do a lot of downhill now. But this is a cabin I grew up in. Um, the one on the left is like the cabin cabin that was built in 1917. The one on the right is my parents' bedroom. My dad built saunas for a while, and uh, he actually only built one, and that's it. And uh, so he decided to make it into a bedroom. I think it might have been two. Um, but it was cool because we had a Commodore 64 in that bedroom that you had, actually had to start up the fire to warm it up enough so the monitor would actually work. And uh, so it was like a 45-minute process just to play Donkey Kong. Um, but I liked it, and it was, you know, we had a... Uh, 300 baud modem back in the day. My dad worked for the phone company, so we got a phone line for like 10 bucks. No electricity, but you know we had the phone line, and uh, so we could dial up to the internet and CompuServe and all that. So I kind of got into it early on. I live in Denver with my beautiful wife Trish and two lovely teenagers. Um, only lovely usually when they're not around, um, but they're fun. Um, I also have a middle child. His name is Hefe. I bought him in 2004 off eBay and uh, spent. 10 years in seven different shops, all in Colorado, making him look like this. So I'm happy to say he's awesome now, and uh, he's got a Porsche engine and everything, so pretty fun. Who's a developer? Who likes writing authentication? Nobody. <laughs> Developer.octa.com. We'll do it for you. Um, so I work for Okta as a developer evangelist. Before that, I was an independent consultant for about 20 years, doing a lot of Java champion. I do a lot of JavaScript and TypeScript as well. I really like Angular and React. Um, but at Okta, we do user management in the cloud. So if you're a developer or not a developer, you can basically sign up for a free account. Uh, 7,000 active monthly users, so you've got to have you know, a pretty good clip of a site going before you actually hit the limits. All that's free. You can have up to 20 apps, and you can register OIDC apps or OAuth apps. And I'll show you. I won't show you how to do it, but I'll kind of talk about that process. And that'll work for any OAuth provider. And so we support. OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, and SAML. So now that you know a little bit about me, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. So how many people are doing .NET development? We got one, two, like one and a half. Uh, any Java developers? OK, we got about six or seven. Uh, anyone doing Node or JavaScript? About the rest of the room, anyone doing Python? OK, we got about five or six. All right. Has anyone ever written authentication from scratch? Even if you're just talking to a database and you know storing your passwords there? Did you store your passwords in plain text? Sometimes, right? I mean, T-Mobile still does that. I don't know if you saw that like last week on Twitter, but they were like, no, we keep them in plain text so we can look them up and log in as the user if we want. <laughs> it's like, even if you do that, you don't tell Twitter that you do that, right? And then they were like, we have really good security, so we don't have to worry. It's like, yeah, whatever. Um, has anyone implemented OAuth like a client or a server? A couple of you? OK. Was it painful or not so bad? Pretty easy. And it was quick and easy. What about you? No problem? Wasn't too hard? Right. Nice. <laughs> That's the best way to do it, probably. Has anyone ever heard of Okta or is an Okta customer? Who's an Okta customer? We got a few. Okay. I wish I had like, more stuff to give away, but 
Um, usually, I started at Okta a year and a half ago. They acquired a company called Stormpath, and Stormpath did the same thing, authentication in the cloud. And uh, when I first started speaking at conferences around the globe, um, it was zero. Right? It was hardly any developers ever heard of it. So um, chances are you guys might be using it at your companies, and you have to like click on a thing to log into different websites and stuff. So it's a single sign-on solution that a lot of IT departments install for their employees. Um, but it's also a way of taking all your users and then exposing those in apps. And so apps can hook into Okta um, using OIDC, and you can even have people like register and create new users and stuff like that. So it's a way, if you're already using Okta as a company, basically have that user management and put it into your apps as well and you're managing like your customers data and your employees data all in Okta so it's kind of you know one place. What about Auth0? Anyone heard of Auth0? So they're a competitor, a couple of you. Um, I like that it's less. <laughs> what about like AWS Incognito or Cognito it's called. Um, that's a solution from Amazon. So there's there's lots of companies doing this now. There's one login, there's ping identity um, that you know have this authentication in the cloud. And the funny thing is with Okta, with Stormpath, I started talking to the guys before they even started it in about 2010 or 11. And I was like, I don't know if people are really going to want to put their users in the cloud. Um, but now, almost 10 years later, like tons of people are doing it and realize that maybe they're not so good at keeping them on premises. So maybe you know, if someone's got more experience, putting them in the cloud does work. Um, is anyone here for a particular reason? Like, they want to shout it out. They want me to address what they're here for. I always ask just in case. OK. Hopefully, you're here for entertainment. <laughs> I don't know if I can do it with OAuth, too, but I'll try. So there's a lot of confusion about what OAuth actually is. Um, some people think it's a login flow, and some people think it's a security thing, and, uh, and really don't know much more than that. And I'm going to show you what it is, how it works, and hopefully leave you with a sense of how and where OAuth can benefit your application. So OAuth stands for Open Authorizations. And there's two versions of OAuth. There's 1.0a and 2.0. And they're completely different from each other. 1.0a was very like web-centric. And 2.0 kind of became this more behemoth because a lot of enterprises got involved, as well as internet scale companies. Um, so there's no backward compatibility between them. It's like struts 1 and struts 2. It's like Angular 1 and Angular 2. Like, there's just not even similar at all. Um, so whenever I say OAuth today, I'm talking about OAuth 2.0. So it works over HTTPS. That's one of the requirements. If you do it over HTTP, I mean, you can, but you're violating principles, and some OAuth providers won't work unless it's over HTTPS. And it authorizes devices, API servers. So it's an authorization framework, basically. Um, it's not an authentication protocol. I need to restate that many, many times, that you shouldn't use OAuth for authentication. There are ways, and I will talk about that, but there's also better ways that you can do it with OpenID Connect. So OAuth was created as a response to the direct authentication pattern. So is anyone familiar with HTTP authentication? There's basic, there's digest, like those are just parts of HTTP. And how they work is you set an authorization header, and then you have, as part of that header, you have, for basic authentication, you have the word basic a space, and then you have your username and password encoded base64. And that's it. And so if you have a server that's configured for you know, basic HTTP authentication, whether it's Apache or Nginx, um, then you'll be logged in as long as you set that header. If you're in a browser, what you'll see is that little pop-up window, that little dialog that comes up, and you type it in, then you're logged in. Well, one of the problems with HTTP basic authentication is there's no way to log out once you're logged in, right? So um, digest authentication is the same thing, but instead of using the basic keyword, they use digest, and they encrypt everything. Um, you don't see it as much, um, but it is a way to do basic HTTP authentication. But then we got into, on the web, basically form-based authentication. Like A lot of web apps use form-based authentication, right? You type in a username and password, it goes to a database and looks them up. I don't know if you remember back in 2004 and 2005, like LinkedIn was coming out, there was Yelp. And once you signed up for LinkedIn or Yelp, it prompted you for your Gmail username and password. And so this is on Yelp's site, and you're typing in your Gmail username and password so they can go and download all your contacts and spam everyone. And so this is the direct authentication pattern, also known as the password anti-pattern, um, because basically you're trusting someone like Yelp to not keep 
your password, right? The plain text version of your password, they can log into your email at any time and they could start sending messages, they could do whatever, right? Or they could log into your other accounts because they have your password and people often use that across different sites. So um, it was basically a way of saying, hey, that isn't the way that we should do identity across different websites. So federated identity was created for single sign-on. And there's two main players in the federated identity system. There's an identity provider, and then there's a service provider. An identity provider is usually whoever contains the users, right? It might be Google with, you know, the various Google accounts. It might be LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn has a data store. It might be your company keeping the users at Okta, right? That's all the identity provider. And then the service provider is basically the application, right, that you need to log into. And so how federated identity works is basically the user navigates to the application and then they're redirected to somewhere else like Gmail. They log in and then with if they're already logged in, they won't even see it, right? It'll be like a flash of the screen and they'll come back to the application. It'll be like, okay, I know who you are. And then the identity provider get, gets an, or provides an access token and that access token is then used when um, that application makes calls. And so it was made famous by SAML 2.0, an OASIS standard released in March 2005. It's a large spec, but the two main components are its authentication request protocol and the assertion, also called SAML assertions. And so this does the same kind of thing where it redirects back and forth. It's all browser-based. And you know, it starts with someone saying, hey, are you part of Okta? Yes, and then you know, prompts you for your authentication, and then it actually logs you in. So there's still a bunch of redirection going on. And the SAML assertion has the data in it. If you like XML, you're going to love SAML. If you don't, well, then you probably shouldn't be using SAML. But um, sorry, it's a bit blurry there. But it's got the issuer. It's got some of the information in bold and blue there, the name, um, the audience, and all this other stuff. This is similar information that's contained in an ID token when we get into OpenID Connect. But SAML is ba basically web SSO, and it's basically a session cookie in your browser that gives you access to web apps. Um, it's limited to the kinds of device profiles and scenarios you might be able to work with outside the browser. So we built applications in 2005 with WS Star. So a lot's happened since then. In 2005, uh, SOA was a big thing. Now it's called microservices, still a lot of the same concepts. But it lived behind a DMZ or behind a firewall. And you didn't really have to worry about you know, identity outside that firewall. Anyone used a system or worked on a system like this in the past when everything was behind the firewall? So it made sense in 2005, but a lot's changed since then. Now everything is in the cloud and not behind a VPN. We have modern web and native applications. There's single page applications like you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, Gmail. They have different behaviors in their traditional applications. They make background requests, Ajax calls for everything. And mobile phones make AB, API calls too, as well as TVs, gaming consoles, and everything you know, that, that basically talks to the internet, IoT devices even. And SAML SO isn't very good at any of this. Now most developers have moved to REST APIs and stateless systems. And REST, in a nutshell, is just you know HTTP commands pushing JSON packets over the web. And developers build a lot of APIs. The API economy is a big buzzword. If you Google for it, you'll get top results for IBM, Forbes, and Gartner. Right? Those guys are all like, we got to write about this. Um, so companies need to protect their APIs, and in a way that allows many devices to access it, not just you know web app, but also phones and you know maybe some other system that needs access to it, service-to-service um, -service communication. So there are many API-driven initiatives at companies these days. And the reason is because really every company is becoming a technology company. It's the best way to you know, engage with their customers. A lot of times, if they want to push out information to their customers, they'll develop a mobile app, and then that customer will be able to get alerts and you know, have more engagement with the company. So in the old days, like I said, you know, this is a a screenshot from Yelp. You would enter in your username and password, and the app would log in directly for you. But this gives rise to the delegated authorization problem. How can I allow an app to access my data without necessarily giving it my password? So a lot of times, you'll see a dialogue like this. This is a screenshot I took last year, registering for Bike to Work Day down in Denver. 
and I logged in with Facebook. So it prompts me, you know, do you want to share your public profile with Bike to Work? This is an application asking if it can access data on your behalf. And this is OAuth. So if you've logged in with Facebook, you're an OAuth user. Congratulations. So OAuth 2.0 is basically authorization framework for REST APIs. Enables apps to obtain limited scopes to a user's data without a user's password. So the scopes are the permission levels that you as a developer set what a person can do. And then when the application actually accesses the information or the identity provider, then that identity provider will prompt the user and say, here's what the person wants to do. All right? They want to access your timeline. Um, they want to be able to post to your timeline. They want to be able to tweet, stuff like that. That's all in that initial consent dialogue that comes from OAuth. And it supports multiple use cases for server-to-server -server apps, for consoles and TVs, for browser-based apps. And it kind of you know, makes a lot of things easier. So modern applications aren't just you know, a browser talking to an app. I mean, it does happen that way. And you can use SAML or OpenID Connect as one way. But then that web app might talk to other web APIs in the background. And then the browser app might skip your web app and talk directly to those web APIs. Or you have a native app that talks to APIs. Or you have a server app that doesn't even have anyone like typing stuff in but talks to those same APIs. And then again, API to API. So all of those can be done with OAuth. And I'll, I'll go through the different flows and different scenarios where you might configure one for one thing and one for another. And so you can think of it like hotel key cards, but for apps. So if you have a hotel key card, you can access your room. But you can also access the gym. You can access the pool. Right? There's various resources around the hotel that you can access. If you get a hotel key card, you have to go do an authentication process at the front desk to get it, right? You have to show them some form of ID. You have to give them a driver's license, a credit card. And after authenticating and obtaining the key card, you can access the resources across the hotel. So just to break it down into four simple steps, the app requests authentication from the user. The user authorizes the app and delivers proof. And usually what they've done, if they're already logged into something like Facebook, um, they won't you know, get prompted. Or they'll get prompted for, here's what this app wants to do. And then the app prevents proof of authorization to the server to get a token. So this sometimes happens in the background. You actually don't see this as an end user. And then the token is restricted to only access what the user authorized for the specific app. So the token should have information in it that says, here's what the user can do. So it's built on the following central concepts. There's actors, there's clients, there's scopes and consent, tokens, authorization server, and flows. So the actors in OAuth flows are as so follows. The resource owner is basically you. You own the data in the resource server. For example, I'm the resource owner of my Facebook profile. The resource server is the API which stores the data the application wants to access. The client, this is often confused and overloaded, right? We use client for everything these days is the application. Um, so in OAuth terms, every time you see client when they're talking about OAuth, just think application. And it'll probably be much easier for you because apps are often called clients, right? But um, we call them applications. And at Okta, um, I think Auth0 calls them clients, and they're moving to calling them applications. So that's kind of the standard across the industry. And then the authorization server is the main engine of OAuth. So the resource owner is a, a role that can change with different credentials. It could be an end user, can be a company, can be a service. Um, if you look at Google's as an example, the authorization server would be like accounts.google.com, and then the resource server would be your email. Right, that's what you're trying to access. So when you try to log into Gmail, it redirects you. It makes you log in with one of your accounts, and then it goes back to that resource server. So clients, these are actual, you know, again applications can be public and confidential. Um, there's a significant distinct distinction between the two. Uh, confidential clients means they can be trusted to store a secret. That means people can't hack into it. Now, I know that most things are hackable, so you know it can probably be hacked into, but it's not that easy. So um, public, an example of that is browsers, mobile apps, and IoT devices. If you ever have a client secret, never put it in a mobile app. And distribute in an app store. Those are not to be trusted devices, right? People can jailbreak it. They could get your client secret as soon as they have an ID and a secret. 
they can talk to the API and they can pretty much do whatever they want, right? So um, dangerous, don't do that. Um, as far as confidential clients, those are things like set-top boxes, right? IoT um, devices, well, no, IoT is in the, in the public ones, but things that you can't get to as easily. And so clients or applications, uh, client registration is the DMV of OAuth. So when you're developing an application, before you can even have it as an OAuth enabled app, you have to register it with an OAuth provider. And when you do that, what the OAuth provider gives you is a client ID, and depending on the flows that you're implementing, a client secret. And so then you'll use those to communicate with the server. Um, it's like you need a license plate for your application, basically. And this is how your app's logo shows up in the authorization dialogs here. You can see this uh, little form on the right. Um, you tell it what type of application, you give it a name, then you can upload an image, and then you'll whitelist redirect URI. So when it goes to the authorization server and it prompts you for either login or just the scopes, um, you'll be redirected back to your app. And when you do this registration, you have to whitelist the URLs and the redirect URIs. Because if they're not there, then OAuth says, hey, I don't, I'm not just going to redirect back to anyone, right? I need to redirect back to what that person said. And so the scopes are additive bundles of permission asked by the client when requesting a token. So it's a bit difficult to see here, but up here it says authorize Facebook to use your account. And it says what it allows, like updating your profile, what it doesn't allow. Um, I can read it better here. Like see your Twitter password. Probably a good one not to allow it to do, right? <laughs> and then read tweets from your timeline, post tweets for you. Um, basically, if you ever see an application that wants to post your timeline or post tweets for you, I usually say, I'm out, right? I don't really want you acting on my behalf and posting stuff. So um, it decouples authorization policy decisions from enforcement. So um, it basically has, it shows who owns the data and how do you get specific authorization policies for that data. So a lot of the authorization concepts in OAuth are based around these scopes. Um, but scopes aren't defined. They're basically just a string, a space-separated string you send to the server. And that server defines what those scopes mean. Um, that's one of the differences between OAuth and OpenID Connect is OpenID Connect is a standard set of scopes. With OAuth, it's just in the spec. It's like whatever you want. So you have to capture consent, and it's called trusting on first use, and it's a pretty significant change from what people experience on the web. They're used to just you know, logging in with username and password. And a lot of the you know, older population probably would enter their Gmail username and password if you prompted them for it, right? Even if they were on a different site, they'd be like, well, yeah, I know it, so I'll just type it in. Um, but most people before OAuth were you know, used to that username and password, so it's difficult to train a whole internet population on you know, hey, I'm going to go to a different site, you're going to log in there, and then you're going to come back. So that's one of the hardest parts, but it can be time sensitive. So this is, as you're coding, you can actually have scopes that are only good for 30 days. So you're only authorizing this application for 30 days. A lot of them, if you go into your Facebook settings or you go into Twitter, your Twitter settings where you've logged in with those, you know, applications, um, they'll still be, like, activated. You can go in there and delete them, right? You can deactivate them in a sense. And then there's also, you know, network updates or invitations and messages, right? What it's going to do. So it, it shows you that. And then it also shows that you can be revoked. I know that's hard to see, but you may revoke access at any time, usually by going to your applications, you know, from what you logged in with. If you logged in with Facebook, you go into Facebook, you go into your applications, you say, hey, I should check these. And I don't know if anyone noticed with the recent Facebook fiasco, but they started popping something up at the top that said, hey, go check your settings, right? And go talk or configure your apps or deconfigure them and log out. And that's basically just deleting tokens that OAuth has you know, set up there. So um, this is what that dashboard might look like, where you have a number of different you know, apps that you've logged into. And you should be able to go in there and you know, remove that access. So OAuth has two types of tokens. There's an access token and a refresh token. Access tokens are the token the client uses to access the resource server. So similar to I said, we had an authorization header with a basic space, you know, encoded username and password. With OAuth, you have bearer instead of basic, then you have a space, and then you have an opaque string. 
Uh, the spec doesn't require you use any sort of JWT or any sort of encoding or anything like that. It's just basically a string. So whatever string you want, a lot of uh, people just use you know random grids and put them in there. There's nothing in the spec that makes you use something particular. They're meant to be short-lived. Um, they're meant to be hours and minutes, not days and months. And then the other one is a refresh token. So this is very long-lived. And how refresh tokens work is you can go and use a refresh token to get a new access token. So this can be you know, days, months, years. And uh, they're just used to get new tokens. It can also be revoked. So access tokens typically, um, depending on implementation, can't be revoked. Uh, but refresh tokens can be. So when you know, the access token expires, say, after five minutes, and someone wants to use a refresh token to go get a new one, they can be like, no, you can't do that. So OAuth, like I said, doesn't define the format of the token. It can be whatever format it wants. There's also self-encoded tokens. So these ones um, will be implemented as a signed JWT. JWT is also known as JWT. It's actually in the spec where they J-O-T. Um, and then there's you know reference tokens. Those are opaque tokens. Those are the you know just random ones. So um, you can do self-encoded tokens with uh, JWTs, and those can be revoked and not really revoked, but that's just kind of the nature of the token itself um, because it does have a signature in there and it's got dates in there and expires at a certain time. So in there, when people validate that JWT, um, it can not be valid if it's already passed a certain time. And so there is a JSON Web Token standard. Um, and it's basically just a trust trustworthy standard for token authentication, and they allow you to digitally sign information, oft often called claims, with a signature that can be verified at a later time with a secret signing key. So this, you'll notice, it's just basically a big long string with two dots in it, and those dots separate the header from the claims. The claims are like who's the issuer, who's the person or the ID. It's usually just you know a random string. Um, the audience you want to talk to, there's issued at time and expires time. That AMR is how they logged in. So this one says uh, password, but if you use like multi-factor authentication, it would say a you know, password or multi-factor would have both those in there. And then like the authorization time, the email. And then the header finds the algorithm and a key um, that's used to actually you know, parse that and verify that it's correct. And audience is a very important part of OAuth that's often overlooked. So the OAuth 2.0 bearer token specification allows any party in possession of a bearer token to get access to the associated resources without demonstrating the position of a cryptographic key. But to prevent misuse, two important security assumptions must hold. Bearer tokens must be protected. That's HTTPS. And the audience has to match. And so there will be validation on the back end that says, hey, the audience in this token actually matches me as audience of this you know, resource. So here's how it looks. You basically see the client or the application you know, uses an issuer and the audience. It goes to the resource server. And as long as that audience matches, that'll work. On the back end, if the audience doesn't match, it's not going to work. So that's you know, logic that you will use in your application when it validates that token. Um, if the audience doesn't match, then you know, all bets are off. So tokens are retrieved from endpoints on the authorization server. So how it works is you'll hit an application, and it'll redirect to your IDP or your identity provider. And it'll have this authorize endpoint. And then it'll have a bunch of parameters on top of that. It'll have like a client ID. It'll have a redirect URI. It might have a state. And the state is just like a random number. Um, and then you might be prompted to log in if you haven't logged in, and then it'll redirect back to your app. And then your app will hit the token endpoint, usually with a code, and then that token endpoint gives you back that access and those refresh tokens. And a lot of this stuff you don't see. And what I'll show you is there's libraries out here that make it so you don't even have to really care. Um, but it's kind of important to know what's going on under the covers. So that refresh token um, can be sent back to the token endpoint if you want to get a new access token. Um, you can also send that access token to the introspect endpoint, which OAuth providers are, you know, if they're set compliant, they have. And so you can do your local JOT validation, or you can send it to this introspect endpoint, and that'll say, hey, this is valid. And the problem with all this is there's a lot of friction for developers, right? The token state management. So 
of the biggest pain points is having to manage the refresh tokens, right? Do you, do you wait for an error to happen, or are you proactive and like, you know, pulling to see if it's expired? Um, and it's why developers love API keys, right? API keys are typically, you know, a key and you know either a special secret that goes with it or just a key, and they can just slap those in an application and they're good to go. Don't check it into GitHub, but you know you can have an API key and it's you know it's very valuable. Um, but there's a pay-to-play problem here because it's very bad for security to just have you know a string that allows someone to access your API and pretty much do whatever that person you know has that string can do. So getting developers to do all auth flows increases the security, but there's a lot of friction. Um, and there's really an opportunity for toolkits and platforms and even you know providers of OAuth to make that very easily. And so OAuth came out in 2012, and it's been six years, and there's a lot of really great tools out there. I read a lot of blog posts for Okta about you know how do you do it with Java versus .NET versus you know Node. And, uh, and a lot of times, we have SDKs that simplify things. So if you're doing Node development, you can download our OIDC middleware. And you know you only have to plug in a few things and it works, um, but you can also probably download an OIDC library and use that. And since we're spec compliant, it'll all just work. So it was funny when I first started Okta, Stormpath had some really good SDKs, but Stormpath really didn't implement OAuth. So when I started at Okta, I was like, well, Spring Boot. Let's see what Spring Boot Okta comes up with. And there was like nothing. And I was like, golden opportunity, right? Because Spring Boot in Java world is you know a pretty big thing and so uh, I was just able to use like Spring Security and it's a lot of support and plug in a few values from an application I created and it all just works so you know it is nice having those standards compliant things and it's not just Okta right I could have plugged in Google's values or I could have plugged in LinkedIn's values and they would work as well so um, standards are great for that. So we talked a bit about the client types, the token types and the endpoints of the authorization server and how we can use those to get access to the resource server. Um, and I mentioned two different flows, getting the authorization and getting the tokens. So these don't necessarily have to happen on the same channel. There's a front channel that basically is what goes over the browser. The browser redirects to the authorization server and the user gives consent. And this all happens in the user's browser and it's not as secure as a back channel. Back channel is basically a server side component of your application that can talk via HTTPS to the identity provider and get tokens for you. So it's a much more secure way to do, um, basically exchanging the authorization grant for the tokens. So here's how those kind of look. And so the front channel flow, um, you can see the steps here. The resource owner starts the flow to delegate access to a protected resource, sends the authorization request. And what'll happen is the server will come back with an authorization code grant. And oftentimes, this is just a URL parameter that says code equals. And then you will have your server side take that code, send it to the token endpoints, and then get the access tokens that way. So the beauty of that is there's those access tokens are never seen like in the real world, right? They're not seen in a browser. Because when you only do it on the front channel, you basically get those access tokens. And then where do you store them? Local storage which isn't like that secure, right? It's great if you have a web app that there's no third party scripts on, so there's no danger of like someone accessing your local storage, but you know, once marketing gets involved, it's tough to do that. So there's a variance in this flow called implicit flow. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but this is what it looks like going on the wire. So this is a request to Gmail. So you're hitting that authorized endpoint, which you know they define as that URL. And then those scopes, you can see it's just what you want to be able to do with Gmail. And so Gmail defines it with their API. They say, hey, if you want to do this, you know, these are the scopes you need to send. The redirect URI comes back to your application. So you'll have a callback that actually processes those tokens or the code. And then the response type is code. So you're saying, I don't want tokens. I want that authorization code. And then I'm going to use my backend to send that code to get the tokens that way. Um, client ID is from your DMV registration. And a state is a random number. You can make it up, but you probably should make it random. And then it's for you when it comes back, so you can verify that, hey, that state hasn't changed. So it's just another check mechanism for you as a developer. The response, it'll give basically a 302 if you're already logged in. It'll hit that callback one. It'll give you that code and that state that should match. 
And then so the back channel flow is the client exchanges that authorization code grant for that access token and optionally refresh token. And then the client can access protected resources. So the token request looks like this. It has to be a post. It's part of the spec. Um, and you'll send the code, the client ID, and the client secret. Right? So this is why it's more secure, because you're actually sending that secret. And then again, the redirect URI and the grant type of authorization code. And the grant type is the extensibility part of OAuth. So it's an authorization code from a pre-computed perspective, but it opens up the flexibility to have many ways of grants. So this is just one of the many grants, and it's the most common type of OAuth flow, this, this uh, authorization code grant. And the token response will be something like this, where it has an access token, token type, when it expires, and a refresh token. And you notice those are just opaque strings. They're just random characters. Um, the response is typically JSON. Um, and you can be reactive or proactive in using those tokens. Proactive is you have a timer that says, hey, this is going to time out in 3,600 milliseconds. So you know we need to send that refresh token to get a new one. Um, the reactive way is you catch an error and try to get a new token. So a lot of times, as developers, you won't have to worry about this um, because your library might take care of it for you. Um, but you should test it. So set your access tokens to time out in you know, a couple seconds or something like that, and then you know, leave your browser for a few seconds. See if you can still do stuff. If it'll automatically go and get that refresh token for you. Because a lot of times, it won't. And then you go read the documentation, and it's like five lines of code, and then it'll do it for you. So um, just be aware of that, that you might have to do a little more configuration with whatever library you're doing to, to make those refresh tokens go get new access tokens. And then you have protected resources that will basically look for this authorization header and do like JOT validation or whatever you know, kind of validation you need. Maybe talk to introspect endpoint and say, hey, is this access token still valid? And so there's a number of different grant types or flows. There's implicit, which is called two-legged. Um, the reason it's called implicit is because all the communication is happening through the browser. There's no backend server redeeming the authorization grant for an access token. A good example of this is spots, right? Single page applications that there is no backend. They're just talking to various APIs on the web. You might not even own any of the APIs. And, uh, and it's really the best way to do authentication. Um, but you know, it's typically local storage based. So it gets frowned upon by many people in the OAuth world where they're like, don't use implicit. And, uh, and hey, if I can log in and get my job done, then I'm happy with it. So sometimes you have to, and it works good enough a lot of times. Um, but it's optimized for browser-only public clients. And access tokens returned directly from the authorization request. And it typically does not support refresh tokens. So it depends on your provider whether you get those or not. And assume the resource owner and the public client are on the same device. And it's the most vulnerable to security threats just because everything's on the browser. Um, the gold standard is the authorization code flow, which we kind of walked through. uses the front channel and the back channel. And there's also client credentials for a server-to-server -server communication. So the client application is a confidential client, right? It can store that secret that's acting on its own, not on behalf of the user. It's more of a, like a service account kind of situation. And it supports shared secrets or assertions as client credentials signed with either symmetric, asymmetric, or symmetric keys. And uh, you know, symmetric key algorithms, algorithms are cryptographic algorithms that allow you to decrypt anything as long as you have the password. Um, it's like securing a PDF right, or a zip file. Versus uh, asymmetric is like the public key kind of stuff, um, public keys and private keys. There's also resource owner passwords. So this is a legacy flow, not recommended. Because basically, you could say grant type equals password, and you can pass in a username and password. Um, so it's meant to be used when you have to use it, not like as your default, um, because it's meant for like an old Windows 95 client, right? That can't pop open a browser, or some you know mobile app that can't pop open a browser. Most of them can now, um, but back in 2006 and 7 when they came out, they couldn't really pop a browser, and so uh, so it's it's there um, for old school clients. So don't turn to it unless you really have to. Um, but then again, you're prompting people for their username and password on your site, and you're getting that, you're talking to another server. So not a great thing. Um, assertion flow is another one. Um, this can be used with SAML. So if you have an old system that supports SAML and you want to 
still use OAuth as your you know, point of record or as your resource server protection. Um, you can do that with assertion flows. It does not support refresh tokens. And then not really, it's kind of an extension to the OAuth spec is device flow. So if you've ever used like a Roku box or, uh, or even um, like an Apple TV, it might prompt you with a code and then you have to go somewhere on your phone to that URL and then you type in that code. Um, that's device flow. And what's happening is that application is pulling in the background to see if you've actually authorized it, right? So again, you're just giving that authorization. So there's six different flows. And uh, this adds a lot to the complexity of OAuth, especially if you're implementing it, right? As an end user, as a developer talking to an OAuth client, it's not as bad as like developing an OAuth server. Um, so when people ask you if you support OAuth, um, you might want to ask them, are they asking for all six, or are they just asking for a couple? Um, but there's a pretty cool thing that uh, my friend and coworker just developed. It's called the OAuth 2.0 Playground. So I want to show you this and see if we can play with it a bit. I might forget to uh, mirror and mirror my screen. So let's fix that. I don't know if the live stream worked with that or if it all just cut out. It seems to be working. OK. So what the playground allows you to do um, this is Aaron Parecki's site. He owns OAuth.com, and he wrote this book called OAuth 2.0. Um, it's a great book. It's also right here. So if you want to read an OAuth book, um, you can pay $40, or you can just click through and read the chapters here because it's all online. So Aaron Parecki, um, we worked with him at Okta for the last year, um, kind of you know supported his site and uh, sponsored it, and uh, and you know, distributed his books at talks like this. And then a month ago, we talked him into being a developer evangelist just like me. So that's pretty cool. He's, a, he's on board now, and, uh, and he's, he's great, because having a guy who like, helped author the sex, you can be like, OK, this is how they say it should work, but what do you say, right? And he's like, don't use implicit. And we're like, but it's a spa. You're not writing spas, Aaron. Come on. And uh, so yeah, it's, it's really nice to be working with him. But this, uh, this playground will basically allow you to register a client and a user. And so you'll just click this register button. And it'll actually go out to Okta and create these for you. So it's kind of nice that you didn't have to you know, create an account, log in, like pick all this stuff up. So um, as the internet cooperates. It's the first time I tried to demo this in a talk. So let's we'll see. There we go. So it's got a client ID, a client secret. It's registered those redirects. And it's using the authorization code. It's got refresh token and implicit. And it's even created a login and password for me so I can open those up so I have them over here. And then click continue. And then we can look like at the authorization code flow first. So it says, you know, before authorization begins, first generates a random string for that state parameter. And then all the rest of this is, you know, scopes that are defined by the API. It's going to come back to this URL. There's a client ID that we registered with and the, uh, the response code. So we can hit authorize. And that URL will match right, what it was. Um, but this is, you know, that server said, hey, Okta is my identity provider. So that's why up here it's got this from URL all in there. Right? And so once you get here, like OAuth is out of the picture. Right? The authentication that happens here on this page has nothing to do with OAuth. Right. However, that identity provider logs you in or authenticates you, it's not really, you know, important for OAuth. So I have this information up here that I can use, right? Hurt Ladybird. And my dark frog hilarious rattlesnake. So it's got me back here and it has that code right in the URL and it has that state, which I would validate that it matches what I had before. And then so you he says here, do these match? Yep, it matches. Continue. Oh, now Chrome is going to do the double click thing. So then down here, you exchange the authorization code. So we post that token endpoint with that grant type of authorization code and with that code. And then it gives me back an access token, right? And so you could take this access token because it is a jot. Oh, he doesn't allow copy here. Um, but if you went to like JWT Inspector, I think that's the name. 
you could uh, there's a Chrome plugin, or you could actually um, copy and paste it into here, and then you would see what's in there. Um, so back to here, we can also you know try another flow. For instance, we could do uh, Pixie. Then we heard Pixie P K C E. Um, so this is most uh, recommended for mobile devices, and what happens is the mobile device creates a code verifier. Um, so this is emulated here, but um, then it generates code challenge, a base64 URL. And so it's basically having this string that it generated and it's going to send that to the endpoint, builds authorization URL. And you'll notice that isn't passed anywhere in the URL, right? So it clicks authorize, and then it does prompt you to log in again. This is our password here. Verify. And then you come back here and it says, hey, state matches, continue. And then you exchange the authorization code again. But you'll notice here it's got a code verifier that's actually passed in as well. And so again, it comes back. Well, the last flow we'll look at is, uh, is OpenID Connect. So this the authorization looks the same, that authorized URL. The difference is the scopes are standard. Open ID is one that you'll use probably every time because it basically says, hey, I want to authenticate. So the main difference between Open ID Connect and OAuth is that Open ID Connect gives you user information. OAuth has no way of you finding out about the user. So it's a way of authenticating because you know when you authenticate, then you can get the user information. Right? If they haven't authenticated, well, you can't really get their information. So this Open ID will actually do the authentication when you pass that in. Um, profile will allow you to get like email. Right. Usually it already have display name, but email. And then offline access will get your refresh token. So if you click authorize, verify it again, redirect it back here, that matches. And we can exchange that code. Now the difference is we get an access token and an ID token. So the ID token actually, let's see if I copy this one, um, is a jot, and it has to be a jot. That's part of the spec. So unlike OAuth, where they say the access token and the refresh token could be any random string, um, with OpenID Connect, they say it has to be a jot. And so I got to add this to Chrome. And then down here, JWT. I copy and paste it. Boy, is that small. Let's see if we can make that bigger. You see it's got that kid in that algorithm up there. And then the payload, right? It's got the name in there, how they logged in, preferred username, authorization time, and then the signature. So um, you can actually get information out of there. It also defines a user info endpoint. So you can, if you want more information about the user, you can actually go and talk to it. Now the other thing that it does is it has discovery. So this is uh, this is part of um, OIDC, not part of OAuth, so mine's at OAuth 2 default, and it's called Well-Known Open ID Configuration. This is my provider, and you'll notice in here it's got the issue information, authorization endpoint, token endpoint, user info, JWKS, which is used for validating JWT tokens, um, the grant types it supports right here, it's also got like logout links. It's basically got all the information that you need to actually exchange tokens and do all that. So um, if you use an open ID connect, like when we talked about OAuth, we have all those different endpoints, right? And a lot of times you have to define those. With open ID connect, you should only have to define an issuer, right? Which is this right here. And then this URL beyond that, well known slash open ID configuration is part of the standard. So it should be an issuer, a client ID, depending on your flow, maybe a client secret. So if you're using a cool like OpenID Connect library, you got like three things to specify, and that's it. And now you can you know, do all that authentication and get the user information. So pretty slick. Now let's see. Oh, I wanted to also point out, um, if you're talking to or setting up like an OAuth 2 server, or maybe you're you know talking to Google and you need to like construct buttons that have that authorized URL in there. Um, my friend set this up, oauthdebugger.com. So you enter the authorization URI in that you get from your OAuth provider. 
redirect back to here, and then your client ID, your scopes, and you can, you know, it'll create a URL for you and you can send it. So unlike Aaron's example with the playground, you know, this is fully configurable where you can change anything. Um, and then he also set up, uh, where is it? Open ID, OIDC debugger.com. This is similar, but for OIDC, right? Which is just like a couple things on top of OAuth. So if you want to check those out, especially if you're implementing a server, um, those are pretty nice. Now under. So there's a number of common OAuth security issues. Um, too many inputs that need validation or token hijacking with CSRF. Um, so you always do CSRF tokens with the state parameter to ensure OAuth flow integrity. So that state parameter um, is important. You always whitelist those redirect URIs. Um, hopefully you guys don't have to worry about this because you're not implementing OAuth as a server, um, but you can. If you want to take, you know, you have a, for some reason a large user store and you want to allow people to use that as an identity provider, you could certainly do that. And there's many different server tools and frameworks out there that will allow you to stand up an OAuth server pretty easy. And you can you know, buy Aaron's book or read it online, and that's all about building an OAuth server. Um, for confidential clients, make sure that you know, your client secrets aren't leaked. Um, leaking authorization codes or tokens through redirects, that's why you do that whitelisting. Token hijacking by switching clients, so you bind the same client to authorization grants and token requests. And you know, don't check your client secrets into GitHub. Um, a lot of people do, and I even do it because you know I'm writing a lot of example apps. But what do I do as soon as I do that? I go and delete the client, right? That I've registered at the DMV because you know all of a sudden if people have you know that client ID and client secret, well they could talk to my API and uh, and do bad things. Um, there's also unknown bear and bearer tokens. So the biggest complaint about OAuth in general comes from the security people, as you would expect. Um, it's regarding the bearer tokens and that they can be passed around just like session cookies. So if you're a Java developer, there's a JSession ID cookie that often ends up in your browser window. If you happen to grab that and send it as a header, well, guess what? You just you know got that user session. So um, good reason to use HTTPS. Um, and they are doing things to basically make it so um, there's more like signature-based stuff. and. Uh, and basically, there's a draft specification of OAuth proof of possession token extension that will hopefully allow us to get away from that and have you know more secure stuff. But also, if you use that code grant stuff, um, then that's the the most secure way. So there's a number of you know enterprise use cases. Uh, the nice thing is it's authorization, right? When we're talking about OAuth, so it allows you to adjust those scopes and have scopes however you want in your API. Um, you can restrict and revoke which apps have access to specific APIs. At Okta, we really like it because of the life cycle that's associated with employees, right? If you're using like OIDC or SAML and you have everyone registering, you know, for access to those, well, when that employee like leaves for a new company or, you know, gets fired or whatever, it's easy to just go in there and take all their access away and take all their refresh tokens away. So there's deep integrations with identity provisioning workflow to revoke all those tokens. So a number of facts. It's not backwards compatible with 1.0. Interoperability issues exist because it's protocol, or it's not a protocol. It's just an authorization framework, not an authentication framework, not an authentication protocol. That's in the spec. Like, it doesn't have the red part around it, right? But it says OAuth 2 is not an authentication protocol in bold in its own little box. and. That's really because it doesn't say anything about the user. It's an authorization framework, kind of. It's kind of like WS security. Um, and there's a huge number of additions that have happened to OAuth in the last several years. So you can see that OAuth 2 as a framework is built on JSON. And then you have bearer tokens up there as an RFC as well. But all this other stuff, right? This token exchange, this dynamic client registration, the uh, AWTs, JOTs, there's JSON web signatures, there's assertion frameworks, there's that bearer token. Like there's just so much on top of it. And that's that's what happens when enterprises getting involved. Right? I mean, OAuth 2.0 is actually, you know, really nice and like beautiful. I think when it first started, so much so that one of the main guys 
like once you know the IBMs of the world start getting involved, he was like, "I'm out," right? And so it was a very like public display of you know this is getting too complicated. Um, but a lot of times it's just you know enterprise use cases such as federation, um, interoperable tokens, right? Using JOTs that can be signed and encrypted, right? That's not part of the spec, but people are doing it um, because it is an extension. Um, those you know bindings to non HTTP transports and doing LDAP and IMAP and kind of making it work over that. So that's you know a lot of reason for that. Um, so it's not an authentication protocol. Well, then is there a solution for that? Well, it started out as pseudo authentication, made famous by Facebook Connect, which is like 2007, 2008, and Twitter. Um, and this flow of client access is a me endpoint slash me. And so we even had this at Stormpath. Basically, all these these companies said, you know, we're going to implement OAuth, and you can use social login and all that, which is largely based on OAuth, but it also gives OAuth a bad name because, you know, social login doesn't always work the same way. But social login, obviously, you need the user's information, right? Without the user's information, like, who cares that they just gave access to the app? So they developed this slash me endpoint that they could go and get that information from. Um, so some people call it a fake endpoint, but it's really you know just an endpoint. Um, getting back a user profile with an access token. It's a non-standard way, um, and there's nothing in the standards that say you have to do that. So the client accesses a uh, you know api.example.com slash me resource with an access token. It's not authenticating the user, and then those access tokens just prove that the client was authorized and opaque and are going towards the resource service. So to solve that. The best parts of OAuth 2.0, Facebook Connect, and SAML 2.0 are combined to create OpenID Connect. Um, so it's very difficult to talk about OpenID Connect standalone. I would rather say OIDC and never say OAuth again. But it's built on top of OAuth, so you kind of have to say it. And I've tried to stop saying OAuth, but it never seems to work. So it was made famous by Google and Microsoft. Thank you, Google. And uh, Okta's made a big investment as well. And we recommend everyone use OIDC before SAML. Um, SAML can still work, but OIDC is much friendlier to apps, um, especially because you're dealing with JSON instead of XML. And so it extends OAuth 2 with a new signed ID token, like I showed you when I was doing that OAuth playground, and provides a standard set of scopes or claims, so profile, email, address, phone. And there's built-in registration, discovery, and metadata for dynamic federation. So um, SAML has this, where you basically point it at either a file or a URL, and it loads up all the information about the, the sample provider. Well, like I showed with that well-known slash open ID configuration, you can do that same thing with OIDC. So as our clients and our tools get better, um, we'll have to specify less when we configure them. And sports high-level assurance and key sample use cases for the enterprise. And so the only difference, authorization request has those standard scopes in it. So remember before when we were talking to Gmail, we had you know gmail.send and insert. Now we have those standard ones. Um, the token request looks the same. Token response has an ID token in it. And so if you were to pass in uh, just email instead of open ID, then you wouldn't get that ID token. So that's an essential part to get that ID token back. And this is kind of how it works. So the open ID provider metadata you can go and get, and then it performs the OAuth flow and everything else, validates the ID token. And then that user info endpoint down in number five is a you know defining that metadata, but that's where you can get like roles about the user, or you can actually go in usually on your OAuth provider and configure what additional information you add to your user. So at Oct we have like custom profile attributes that you can add. So I built like a crypto uh, currency tracker, so you know you can see how your currencies are doing, and uh, and I would store those in Okta just as JSON as part of a a custom profile attribute, and so you're kind of storing, you know, user information with your users. At Stormpath, we used to allow you to store up to like 10 megs, right, of just a JSON string. So um, usually, it's it's a pretty nice way to do it. And so as far as grant types, if you're doing native development, we recommend the authorization code uh, because it can do that token exchange. If you're doing SPA like Angular, React, or or other, you know, frameworks like Vue, um, Implicit seems to work best with those. But if you can have like a spa and you know a back end built with like Spring Boot or Node or something like that, um, then you can do the authorization code flow. And um, I don't know if I'll have time to show you an example, but you can actually just take your spa and redirect to your back end 
that you know has that authorization code and it can handle all the flow for you and then you just have to have some logic in there that says hey after everything's authenticated go back to the spa and if you package them all together it's probably not a big issue but if you have them as separate apps it might be um, if you're doing you know regular server side with .NET Java or Node uh, use that authorization code and then uh, the client credentials go off to only so implicit flow this is doing you know more of the, uh, the open ID connect versus OAuth um, you should send that open ID um, the user authentication consents to the application's user identity and then the ID token comes back and then if you need more information than what's in that ID token that's where you call the user info endpoint and you do have to send that access token and that authorization header to talk to that user info endpoint So again, if you're doing authorization code flow, same thing, you just get IT tokens instead. All very similar. So session best practices, uh, ID tokens should be used to create a session for a traditional web application, or single page application. Um, use a subject claim called sub in claims as a stable identifier for the user account. So um, I did a bunch of integration into jhipster. jhipster allows you to generate a Spring Boot back end and an Angular front end. And uh, when I first integrated OIDC into it, I was using the preferred username as a sub. Well, the preferred username can change, right? so not a good idea. Um, so I did recently switch that to a sub. And the sub is basically a unique key that will always be tied to that user. Unless that user gets deleted and a new user gets created, then it'll be different. So you can rely on that if you need to tie your application and users in your application to users in the IDP. And it should be able to, it'll always match. Um, session cookies should be protected with HTTP only flag for JavaScript access and uh, avoid using those ID tokens as session tokens um, because the API is not the audience of the token. So for native, um, we talked this about the Pixie, right? I showed you that example. That's P-K-C-E. Um, you pronounce that as Pixie. I only learned that last week, so um, now you're all caught up with me. And uh, you know that does a little bit more to talk to the authorization endpoint, um, but then it gets back the ID token just the same way, and it does the code verifier. So if you're doing native development, um, I have done a few apps where it does use implicit, and it'll pop up in a browser and actually, you know, do the implicit flow. That does work. Um, use Pixie if you can because that's definitely more secure. And if you actually have a mobile app that doesn't pop open like your Safari browser or your Chrome browser on Android, then it shouldn't be trusted um, because that's how they used to do it. They would basically open up a web view in the app, um, but then guess what? They can talk to that web view and get information from it as an app, right, versus it pops up in Safari like the app doesn't know anything. It just sent a URL, and then when it listens for that callback, usually that comes back with that authorization code grant. And so then they can you know do what they need to do after that. But um, if it's if it's opening up a window like in the app, then be scared. So native app best practices is like I said, do not use embedded web views for authenticating users. Do not store client secrets in apps that are on the app store. Try to use Pixie. And there's actually a great guideline, um, OAuth native apps, OAuth 2.0 for native apps. And there's a really cool group that's formed called AppAuth that implements um, a lot of JavaScript, iOS, and Android tools that you can use to just basically add a few lines of code to your app, and you can talk to an OAuth endpoint. And so at Okta, we have a few different things that we recommend users to do. Like I showed you when we redirected, um, you actually see an Okta login screen. If you would rather have the login screen embedded in your app, we have this thing called a sign-in widget. Um, the cool thing is that sign-in widget can do password recovery, um, soon we'll be able to do user registration, um, but it can also do multi-factor authentication. Um, so you just configure a few things, and then it does all of that for you. So um, pretty nice. And it's built on this JS auth SDK that we have. And the auth SDK allows you to basically build login form yourself and just pass in like a username and password. And then it will handle all that authentication for you. So whoever you're working with as your identity provider should have similar tools that you can use. Um, Okta might be a little different than you know Google or Facebook or LinkedIn because if you're using one of those to manage your users, you can't really go in there and manage users, right? You can't go into Gmail and say, 
here's all the users. You can just say, hey, you can log in if you have a Gmail account. Versus Okta, you can actually, if you have Active Directory set up, you can install an agent that syncs all your users to Okta, and then you know all your users can log in that way. So we implement a number of specifications. Kind of boring, but uh, yeah, there they are. So I have a number of demos, um, but I'm only going to show a couple um, because otherwise, you know, I could write these from scratch and you guys would all fall asleep. Um, so just to show you where they are, um, if you were to go to, oh, I'm not mirrored anymore, right? So remember that. We have Okta Developer on GitHub. And if you just search for a dash example, we're doing pretty good. We got 43, and we built most of those in the last year. Um, so if you want to do Spring Boot microservices, Spring Boot with Angular, JHipster microservices, Spring Boot 2 with Angular 5, this is a pretty popular one, so I'll see if I can run that demo. Um, Spring Boot and React, Ionic, ASP.NET. So um, there's usually blog posts associated with these, so if you click on them, and then at the top, there'll be a link to the blog post as well as like instructions if you just want to actually clone the project and you know change a few things and get it running. Um, but one of my favorite examples is uh, Spring Boot just because they have a super easy one. So I'm going to go into, I won't write the code, I'll just show it to you. You? <laughs> Pretty quiet though, right? It wasn't really disturbing. So I'll open this up. And the reason I like to show this is because it's basically OAuth and like 15 lines of code. Um, so Spring Boot is a framework from Pivotal that basically makes Java and Spring much easier. Um, but they have this command line tool called Spring CLI. And what it allows you to do is you can have a nine-line controller that basically uses these annotations to even define the dependencies. So this one's saying, hey, go out and grab the Spring Boot starter for security, make this a REST controller, and you know this is going to map to the root URL, and I'm just going to say hello world. So if I was to go ahead and let's make this a little bit bigger. We'll close that one. If I was to do spring run hello world, you'll see it start up. And again, all we have is those nine lines of code in this one class. But it starts up, and it puts a default password right in my console. And it changes every time. So um, this is just for the Spring Boot Star security. If I go to localhost 8080, it prompts me, user, put in that password, and it's this hello world, right? So, not much there, but if you look, this whole Hello World auth is really the same thing, except got that enable OAuth to SSO. And then once you have that, it's basically going to look for a number of properties. So in an application YML or .properties file, you basically specify your client IDs, your client secrets, those access token URIs, authorization, and the scopes that you want. And so if I was to start up that one, and you do spring run hello OAuth, it'll redirect to this authorization endpoint. And then we'll do the token exchange behind the scenes to get those access tokens. And it'll also use this user info URI to get the user info. So uh, to refresh this one, you'll notice it goes to that authorized endpoint. And then that redirects to the login screen. I use my demo account. Back with that code. And now it's even able to resolve you know, the user's information from the job security principle object. So Spring Security handles like populating that object with the user information. And if you look at the console, you can see it actually went out and talked to that endpoint to get that user information. So that's pretty slick. Um, I also have. Uh, let's see, Okta. This is a microservices environment running on Heroku. Gateway.herokuapp.com. This is built using Gray Hipster. And you can see this is a single page app. 
right? The front end is all Angular. Now it's packaged and distributed in the war, but if I make any calls from here, it's going to actually talk to you know, the back end. So if you look at this URL, I don't think you can see it here. What it's going to do is it's going to go to octagateway.herokuapp.com slash login. That is what Spring Security basically triggers the redirect. So this is going to, again, send me off to Okta, but I'm already logged in. So now it knows who I am. And it also we've done a little bit of stuff here to take the claims from the uh, groups that the user is in on Okta and set those as roles in Spring Security. So it knows that, hey, this is an admin versus a user. And you can customize all those roles and do that token extraction and those claims verification yourself, too. So those are just a few demos I had. Obviously, there's lots more. Um, with JHipster, we use KeyCloak by default. KeyCloak is an open source project from Red Hat. Um, if you want a supported version, basically say just buy Red Hat SSO. Um, but it's great for development. We run it as a Docker container when you're doing JHipster development. So you can actually have everything self-contained. Um, the cool thing is all I have to do is specify, uh, let me show you here, some overrides to switch to Okta. So there they are. I just export properties, and Spring Boot is smart enough to read from environment variables as well as local files that have the information in there. So the cool thing is I can check all my key code con for anyone that downloads and creates a hipster project with OpenID Connect. But then I can also override it with my reproduction values and you know have my code that's checked in like work, but you know my real production stuff is is an environment variable. So that's what we recommend. There's a number of OAuth and OID libraries out there. There's Google's OAuth client library. So this is if you want to talk to Google or any OAuth provider. Um, Scribe Java Spring Security OAuth is one of my favorites. Uh, Spring Security 5 is actually based on the Nimbus SDK. So I have them listed separately here, but they're kind of combining. Like a lot of the Nimbus stuff is doing the underlying OIDC work for Spring Security. And then OAuth.net slash code has a whole bunch of client and server libraries that you can use for many languages. Here's a few popular open source ones. There's Ori Hydra, which is written in Go. And it's, uh, it's become wildly popular. It's uh, unfortunately run by one guy. Um, but kudos to him, because he's been so popular and you know doing a great job of developing it. But uh, you know, it might be tough to get production support. Um, there's also Kaz from. Aperio, and I don't know if they always owned it, but Kaz in the Java world has been around for you know almost 20 years, I would say. Um, maybe only 10, but I've been hearing about it since early 2000. Um, Keycloak from Red Hat. And then jhipster UAA, user authentication authorization, is a way using jhipster to generate basically an OAuth server built using Spring Security and then an OAuth client, which you know is typically Angular um, to talk to it. So. Um, if you're interested in that, that's kind of looking how an OAuth server was built. You can go in there and look at all the code for that. Um, the OAuth specification itself is at OAuth.net. You'll notice it's supported by both Okta and Auth0 at the bottom there. And uh, so it's an open protocol to allow you know, secure authorization and got like all the spec information in there as well as books and articles. Um, and there's also OAuth.com. So this is the one that's owned by my coworker, Aaron Perky. So try not to get them confused. Um, they both have good information, but chances are there's going to be a little bit more like commercial stuff right, on the OAuth.com. There's a ton of blog posts that I've written. I think I wrote 25 or 26 in the last year about how to hook up OIDC and to do like even the, uh, the client credentials. One of my coworkers wrote a blog post about that a couple weeks ago and uh, just explaining how it all works. So we encourage you to check that out. Um, I also wrote a book on jhipster um, that's free to download. So you can go and download this from InfoQ. I liked jhipster so much because the Spring Boot on the back end and Angular on the front end. Um, I was doing consulting at the time. I was an independent consultant for 20 years. And so I was like, I need a way to market myself or write a book about it. And so when I started writing the book, I was like, I can't just have any old sample app. I got to have like a real world one. So I kind of learn how this thing works and see how it performs in production and all that. So I built this thing called 21 Points. 21 points. Uh, Spring Boot has a way of monitoring your application that's pretty cool and allows you to like see what's going on inside your application. And when I started writing the book, my wife approached me and was like, hey, 
we should do the sugar detox that my other, you know, fitness friend is into. And I was like, sugar detox, like, sounds cool, right? I don't really like sugar that much anyway. I don't really have a sweet tooth, so I'll do it. So I find out that Monday that no beer is involved in the sugar detox. But we're already into it, right? And so we're like, let's just keep going. We got three weeks. Um, like two days later, we find out that, uh, that we're doing like the hardest level. Like there's different levels, right? There's like you can eat dairy. Um, you can do all this stuff. And, uh, and ours was like, you can't do anything, right? No dairy, you know, black coffee and, and stuff like that. And so um, it was a very bitter time for our relationship. I think we did it like two years into being married. And, uh, and then as it ended, oh, in the first week, I ran out of blood pressure medication. So I went into the doctor post-college. You know, I went to DU down in Denver. And, uh, and the doctor, when I was like 22, was like, if you don't do something about your blood pressure, you're going to have a heart attack before you're 35. So when I met, you know, I had a practice wife, and now I got a real one. So when I met my real one, I was like, I'll go to the doctor and see about this high blood pressure, right? And uh, so I was 38 when I did that, right? So I made it past 35. Um, and I finally went on blood pressure medication. So when we started doing this sugar detox about five years later, um, I ran out of medication the first week. And it's one of these, you know, call the pharmacy to get a new one. They're like, you got to talk to the doctor. And I was like, I'm already pissed at everyone. I don't want to talk to the doctor. So I'm not going to go and do that. So um, after three weeks, my blood pressure was fine for like the first time in 20 years. So I was like, that's the app I need. I need to be able to track like not only my blood pressure, but my exercise and what I'm eating, what I'm putting into my body. So I came up with 21 points as a way of saying you can get 21 points a week. You get three points a day. You get a point if you eat well. For me, that was no sugar. You get a point if you don't drink. And you get a point if you exercise. So I like my craft beers. I'm from Colorado. So that no drinking thing was like, okay, you can have like two. Right. And then I was like, well, let's make it wine and like a Greyhound or, you know, something that's a little healthier. And, uh, and what I found was before I actually wrote the app, I started tracking it. I thought it was being good. Right. I thought it was like I was riding my bike to work every day, you know, and I was, I thought I was, you know, eating healthy and whatever. I got like an eight. And the next week I got a nine right? and I was like, oh, okay, so I got to do some work to it. So now I've been tracking it for about three years and, uh, and I've added, you know, some, some things in there that, you know, make it easier. Um, but I've also noticed that I had a friend who was like, you know, whenever uh, you just, if you have, you know, a fun night out and you drink 10 beers, then you just don't get a point. And I was like, yeah, there's a point about that, right? Like, <laughs> So now I have it that if you drink more than four, you get minus a point. And even if you like exercise that day, it can wipe it out. And then you can also do a double workout, right? So if you want to drink a bunch and do a double workout, you can do that. They might offset each other. I told my friend Ray Sang by, about that. He works for Google. He's like, those are just a lot of excuses, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because you're really just trying to track your health and see, you know, what you're doing wrong. So um, it has been very, you know, influential in my life and, uh, and knowing what I'm doing, and it's cool to be able to go back and look how certain weeks were. So that's in the book. I build the app in the book, and it's open source on GitHub and Rabel slash 21 points. So if you have any questions, uh, please keep in touch. Follow me on Twitter. Um, there's also an Okta Dev handle if you want to see what we're posting about security and various you know things in the industry concerning all languages, not just Java. I typically am Java focused in JavaScript. Um, I will post this presentation up on Speaker Deck. Um, probably later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Um, there's also older versions of it, but I, you know, I typically add a slide or two um, between different times. You'll be able to recognize this one because it's got this lovely picture in the beginning of a bolder picture. All the way, come on. So this guy found it on Flickr. I was like, that's a really cool picture, but it wasn't like common creative licensed, right? So I emailed him and said, hey, can I use this tomorrow night? He said, sure. So pretty nice guy, Chris Anton. I don't know if he lives here or not, but any questions? Yeah. Well, it's really a nice way of actually having it, right? Because um, what I've done, in my J Hipster example, where it's all microservices, there's actually a gateway in the front, and then there's uh, microservice backends. Um, and a lot of times, what I think will happen is, if you're not using OAuth, 
that uh, that you'll just have that gateway like outside the firewall, and then the communication will be secure between that gateway and your backends because it's not on the public internet. Well, with Jots and uh, with, you know OAuth, what you can do is you can pass on that authentication header, and those backend microservices can look for it and be secure, or you can use like public you know key encryption and private key encryption and basically have that channel secure as well because just because if it's over HTTPS even if it's inside a data center like Google says that the cloud is secure and that everything's isolated and AWS is the same thing but better to be safe than sorry right so it's it's a nice way to do that and then if you want to get fancy you can even have you know the gateway be a different client you know to the back end and have your client IDs all over the place instead of reusing that same one so I think it's a real nice way of actually allowing your servers to communicate between each other using like client credentials. And you can still use API keys depending on your provider, too. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. So there's some J Hipster stickers up here, and there's some uh, Okta. May the Okta be with you. And then if you have any questions, feel free to take a card. I usually go through about 10 a year, so no one likes business cards anymore. But if you go and talk to the security people, like those guys live on security cards, right? CISOs and CIOs and CTOs and all those folks, they like them. <laughs>